Live from Case at 12, the night beat starts right now. Two teens are in the hospital tonight recovering from gunshot wounds after being shot at an apartment complex on the southeast side. It happened on Pecan Grove and those two teens have non life threatening injuries, but San Antonio police are still searching for the suspects. The night team's Jaffney Gray went back out to the complex this evening and spoke with neighbors who want the crime to stop. Just making breakfast and everything and then on here is just like real like firecrackers, which they weren't very bad. I mean, it was like AKs shooting everywhere. Residents living at the Pecan Grove Apartments stunned after gunfire rang out in their complex. We just were looking through the window and I saw we saw the little boy, the one of the guys running. San Antonio police say just before nine Sunday morning, a 16 year old girl, a 17 year old boy were sitting in their car in the parking lot. But when they were approached by some individuals, they began shooting at them. Four suspects allegedly fired around 12 shots at the two teens, one hitting the girl in the back and another grazing the boy on his leg. We did recover one weapon from the scene, but it does appear that there were two two guns used in this case. They think that gun thing is the answer and it's not. It's really not, especially when you have little kids involved. This neighbor says gunfire is heard constantly there. I mean, it's horrifying for us. We can't even walk to throw the trash. Police are very aware of this apartment complex. They have had problems. They're constantly breaking into cars. There's shot, uh, you know, uh, drive-bys. I mean, some people shooting and, and people killing here. As residents stay on alert for the suspects who are still at large, they hope for more security and police patrolling. I just hope God just opens their hearts to stop all this crime here. These kids just out here doing stuff for nothing. I mean, that's, you're almost taking lives, or if you did take a life, you're going to have to give your life to the system for nothing. Sergeant Michelle Ramos says that the four suspects that are still at large, they're still searching for them. Witnesses tell police that they were last seen driving off in a white four door sedan. All of them believed to be in their late teens or early 20s. If you have any information that can help lead to an arrest, you're urged to call the homicide unit. That number is 210-207-7635. Tim Courtney. Thank you, Jaffney. Well, the concern over inmate deaths at the Bear County Jail continues. A second demonstration held outside the jail today following yesterday's protest. This one today was a vigil to remember 61 year old Stephen Wayne Cole, an inmate who died in the jail last month. The night team Stephen Cavazos now with the change some are demanding to see. I know the streets. I know the dangers. I know the abuses that you experience on the streets. It was last year Molly Wright said her life was lived out on those streets. She was homeless. You don't have a house. You don't have an apartment. Which is why Wright is hoping to be a voice. Today, she and others gathered outside the Bear County Jail to remember 61-year-old Stephen Wayne Cole, an inmate. Cole was arrested by San Antonio police on December 22nd for criminal trespassing on private property. Cole was also homeless. On December 26, a deputy who was conducting inmate checks found Cole unresponsive in his cell. Cole later dying, his death the third at the Bear County Jail last year. And all three in their 60s, 61-year-old Janice Dotson Stevens and 63-year-old Jack Eulis' deaths were also reported last year. All three charged with criminal trespassing and unable to make their bond of less than $100. This is a scenario that, that quite frankly keeps playing out. Sheriff Javier Salazar speaking out after Cole's death. The cause still not determined. BCSO officials say Cole suffered from an underlying medical condition and chronic drug use. This gentleman had, he was in poor health to begin with, uh, exacerbating it with, with uh, drug use. Uh, and then he's, he's here in this facility where we're just not equipped for that. Back in April, District Attorney Joe Gonzalez stated he will no longer process certain criminal trespassing cases in response to inmate deaths. Despite the policy, officers and deputies can still make arrests on that charge. Wright says she wants to work alongside city leaders determined she can make a difference. I'm going to make sure that there's going to be positive policy that won't um, rob any more dignity that they've already taken away from the homeless people. Now we want to point out that personal recognizance bonds are issued to defendants who cannot afford to pay bail. It is required that that defendant go through a risk assessment and show up to any future court dates. Now Cole was awaiting approval for one of those PR bonds from a judge prior to his death. Tim Courtney. Stephen Cavazos was reporting live for us tonight. Thank you, Stephen. New on the night beat, San Antonio police say a man who led them on a chase 
from the scene of a Southside shooting last month told investigators he swallowed heroin just before he was arrested. Because of that claim, an affidavit says police first released Francisco Javier Gonzalez to paramedics after that chase on December 18th, which began near Canavan Avenue. Yesterday, Gonzalez was formally charged with evading arrest and unauthorized use of a motor vehicle. The day Gonzalez was arrested, police were looking into a shooting when officers found a car matching the suspect's vehicle description. The officers tried to make a traffic stop, and that's when the chase began. Police say Gonzalez drove through stop signs, among several other traffic violations, instead of pulling over. He later crashed the car roughly four miles away and fled on foot before police caught him. Police say Gonzalez actually wasn't involved in the shooting. He just didn't want to pull over because he was in possession of drugs. Mission Concepcion is designated UNESCO World Heritage Site in San Antonio, and right now it's closed to the Catholic community as well as tourists. It will be a temporary closure for a restoration project. It'll begin in just a few days after the parish staff can clear out the altar. The project is expected to take about four months to complete, just in time for one of the biggest Catholic celebrations. The parishioners admit they'll miss praying there, but are aware it's a necessary process for the greater good. We would love to have a big Easter Mass, and we're hoping it would be open. That's, that's the goal. When they do their restoration, hopefully it's going to preserve it for many, many more years for others to come after us. While this work is being done, services will relocate just a few blocks away to Blessed Sacrament Academy Chapel. Around Texas tonight, a man in Houston has turned himself in for fatally shooting his fiance just days after proposing to her. Police say Kendrick Atkins shot Dominic Jefferson after an argument. He then fled the scene, but a witness believes he returned and saw a concerned citizen helping Jefferson. Atkins then shot near that citizen before running away. Jefferson's family says the couple had been dating for three months when he proposed on New Year's Eve. There are reports tonight that two rockets landed on a house near the American embassy in Baghdad. This amid rising tensions in the region and growing threats of retaliation in the wake of U.S. airstrikes, which killed Iranian Gen General Soleimani. Angry mourners filling the streets as his body returned to Iran earlier today. Here's ABC's Motoko Sarabdi with the details. Iran vowing for revenge for the U.S. airstrike that killed General Qassam Soleimani. A red flag symbolic of revenge raised above a mosque. Crowds of mourners lining the streets as the body of Soleimani returned to Iran. All 290 members of the Iranian parliament unanimously chanting death to America with raised fists. Today, specific threats of retaliation. A top military advisor for Ayatollah Khomeini saying U.S. military personnel and sites are sure to be targets. And a former leader of the Revolutionary Guard warning that Israeli cities of Tel Aviv and Haifa are fair game as well. But Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says Americans are safer today than they were before the strike. This was a bad guy. We took him off. Uh, the playing field and that's important because this was the fellow who was the glue who was conducting active plotting against the United States of America. Pompeo adding the administration had the authority to conduct these strikes but Democratic Senator Chuck Schumer disagrees calling the president's foreign policy erratic and unsuccessful. We do not need this president either bumbling or impulsively getting us into a major war. Iraq's parliament approving a resolution to expel U.S. troops from the country. The bill is non-binding and subject to approval by the Iraqi government, but it does have the backing of the outgoing prime minister. The U.S. sending reinforcements to the region, deploying more than 4,000 troops from the 82nd Airborne Division to Kuwait. President Trump tweeting out a warning, if Iran strikes any Americans or American assets, the U.S. has targeted 52 Iranian sites, quote, some at a very high level and important to Iran and the Iranian culture. Mona Kosar Abdi, ABC News, Washington. Meanwhile, three Americans have been killed in a terror attack in Kenya today, according to the Pentagon. One of the Americans killed in action was a U.S. service member. The other two were civilian contractors working for the Defense Department. The Pentagon says the attack occurred at Kenya Defense Force Airfield in Manda Bay. The attack was reportedly carried out by al-Shabaab, which has previously pledged its allegiance to al-Qaeda. According to U.S. Africa Command, the attack also damaged rotary and fixed-wing aircraft on the ground. Soldiers from the Kenya Defense Force and the U.S. Africa Command pushed the al-Shabaab fighters back after they gained entry into that facility. Two Department of Defense workers were also wounded in the attack. Their conditions are stable and they will be evacuated from the base.
Looking outside with live cam tonight, temperatures are in the low 50s, wrapping up what has been a absolutely beautiful weekend. And despite our issues with mountain cedar the past couple of days, I hope you were able to get out and enjoy the beautiful weather this weekend. We've got two planning forecasts in the front, uh, two plan two fronts in the planning forecast. Let me start that one over again. <laughs> two fronts in the planning forecast this week. One rolls through tomorrow evening. We'll talk about that coming up, but first getting you ready to get the kiddos back out to school tomorrow morning. It'll be cool. Jacket weather for sure. Temperatures in the low 40s, mostly sunny skies and maybe a little bit of patchy fog coming up. We'll talk about where you could see some fog in the morning and get you a look at your full forecast for the week ahead. Guys. Thank you, Katie. Here at KSAT 12, we're launching a new segment called Leading SA. GMSA's Max Massey will be sitting down with leaders of San Antonio to talk about current issues in our community, what's being done to solve problems, and about the future. The first interview will be with, Ma with Mayor Ron Nuremberg, and we want you to get involved. Right now at KSAT.com, you can submit questions that we may ask the mayor. Leading SA will air on GMSA Sunday mornings at 8 a.m., Head to KSAT.com to submit your own questions right now, and you could see your questions asked tomorrow night. And while you're visiting the website, you can also check out the premiere episode of our new show, Texas Eats. It's a new adventure featuring KSAT's David Elder. The first episode was an ode to San Antonio Tex-Mex. Elder visited restaurants around the city to look for some of the best Tex-Mex and even showed local residents how to shop the aisles of HEB for the ingredients needed to make his own mother's famous enchilada casserole. In addition to our website, you can catch Texas Eats Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. or on the KSAT TV live stream app available wherever you stream. Still ahead on the night beat, terror on the turnpike. Several people are dead tonight following a massive chain reaction crash on a Pennsylvania highway. What authorities say led to that crash. Plus, an entire family hospitalized after their Detroit area home explodes. A closer look at the aftermath and the potential cause. And coming up next, we'll have highlights from the Golden Globe Awards. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. Big night for Hollywood. As expected, the Golden Globes left everyone talking. We have a recap of the star-studded event. Here's ABC's Elizabeth Herr with who came out on top tonight. I love you, man. Don't have me whacked. Um, a sigh and tonight, gasp at the Shears Golden Globes. In this room are some of the most important TV and film executives in the world. People from every background, but they all have one thing in common. They're all terrified of Ronan Farrow. <laughs> He's coming for you. He's coming for you. With five-time host Ricky Gervais unhinged and uncensored, among the early winners, Russell Crowe for the loudest voice. He did not appear due to the wildfires in his native Australia, but passed along this message. We need to act based on science, move our global workforce to renewable energy, and respect our planet for the unique and amazing place it is. The Carol Burnett Award for television accomplishment going to Ellen DeGeneres. Thank you so much, everybody. Best Supporting Actress in a Motion Picture, Laura Dern for Merit Story. Amazon's Fleabag taking home Best TV Series or Musical Comedy. And earlier in the night, Phoebe Waller-Bridge winning Best Actress in that same series. The famed team of Elton John and Bernie Taupin winning Best Original Song okay, Motion I'm Picture good. for I'm Gonna Love Me Again in Rocket Man, the only award they have ever won together. Patricia Arquette in a rare moment for the night getting political after her win for Best Supporting Actress in a miniseries. Beg and plead for everyone we know to vote in 2020. And Tom Hanks taking home the Cecil B. DeMille Lifetime Achievement Award. And, and Elizabeth Herr, ABC News, New really? York. Really? Tom Hanks had quite a speech tonight. Yeah, he did. He had me crying. I'm not going to lie. He's just a classic. As if you couldn't love him more. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I couldn't love the weather more today. Yeah. To Meanwhile, we're crying because of all of the mountains. <laughs> but we are in the crying. Air. Oh my gosh. I ser seriously sitting over there a couple minutes ago, my eyes just yeah. itchy. Yeah. It's yeah. everywhere, you know. Yeah. If you're not Sorry suffering from it, you're Superman or Superwoman. <laughs> I don't know how. <laughs> Consider yourself lucky. Yeah, and unfortunately, the setup we have going into this next week as everyone's trying to get back into the routine. Most of our kiddos head back to school tomorrow. This is not the ideal setup to wash out any of the mountain cedar that has been in the air, despite two cold fronts in the forecast this week. The first one that moves through tomorrow evening will be rain free. The second one toward the end of the week that moves through on Friday evening, that one we have a shot at some isolated showers 
showers and storms, but rain doesn't look to be too widespread for us here in South Texas. Temperatures are tumbling nicely as we speak this evening. 42 up in Kerrville, 52 in San Antonio, 57 in Catula. Nice and cool out there this evening. There's some colder air. Well, to our north, along and north of the I-20 corridor, 40s in Dallas and even in Waco, 43 in San Angelo, 40 in Lubbock, 38 in Amarillo. So a bit colder off to our north. There's actually the cold front that moves through tomorrow evening stalled just off to our north. So it looks like it may be just to the south of San Angelo as they have fallen into the 40s, but it's sitting somewhere between the hill country and San Angelo tonight. And you can see even on satellite and radar, it's not even bringing in any cloud cover, definitely not any rain. So this is going to be a dry cold front for us that moves through tomorrow evening. So overnight tonight, it's going to become stationary. It's not going to move very much through early tomorrow morning. We're looking at mostly sunny skies in the morning, a few additional clouds compared to the past couple of days and some patchy fog possible here in San Antonio. I think fog could be a bit more widespread down on the coastal bend southeast of the I-35 corridor, but it should be pretty short lived tomorrow morning, and I don't expect any big issues with the Monday morning commute as far as fog is concerned tomorrow afternoon. It's going to be warm again. We'll climb back into the 70s as this cold front starts its slow trek to the south. It'll be moving through San Antonio shortly after sunset. I'm thinking between about 8 and 9 p.m. Moving well to the south tomorrow night, clearing the area by early Tuesday morning. We'll wake up to sunny skies on Tuesday, but breezy winds will settle in Monday night through early on Tuesday, and that could kick up the cedar counts again by Tuesday. Tuesday morning, sunny skies and temperatures in the 40s. We've also got really low humidity in place next couple of days. Dew points will try to climb a bit tomorrow afternoon before that cold front gets here, but then we've got bone dry air Tuesday. Wednesday, though, things will start to turn around pretty quickly. We'll get a south wind back in place by Wednesday, and then you see a gradual trend upward in our dew point temperatures. By late Thursday, early Friday, we'll have dew point temperatures in the 60s, meaning it's going to be feeling a lot more humid out there, and we'll have a lot of moisture moving in from the Gulf of Mexico. And that brings me to the second front that arrives later this week, Friday evening and early on Saturday. Low pressure system moving through North Texas. Typically, if we can get a surface low actually moving through the state, that helps us out with rain chances here in South Texas, and there will be some healthy moisture return Thursday into early on Friday as the surface low is kind of winding itself up just a bit. Unfortunately, it looks like all the good rain making energy as that moisture return happens will be up in North and East Texas Friday afternoon and evening in this yellow area uh, is an area really from Houston up to College Station just east of Dallas and then over into Louisiana where there could be some severe thunderstorms late Friday evening. That does not include our area. We're going to be on the tail end of things. However, I can't rule out some isolated showers and a few rumbles of thunder late Friday overnight through the pre dawn hours of Saturday morning as this cold front moves through clearing us out for another beautiful weekend next week. And so the days to watch this week as far as Mountain Cedar is concerned, front comes through tomorrow evening. Mountain Cedar could spike again on Tuesday. Similar setup, second front on Friday evening. Mountain Cedar could spike again by next Saturday. So just some uh, days to keep in mind there as far as allergens are concerned. Uh, no big blasts of cold air coming in. The coolest will get low 60s by the start of next weekend. And we'll just go ahead and keep our nice weekend weather streak going. A little taste Why of not? spring this week. Yeah, every weekend. Yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> All right, we'll be right back. The Jason Garrett watch is over. Cowboys owner Jerry Jones making the big announcement during the Eagles playoff game today. Our Greg Simmons here now with more on what's on instant replay. Tonight. How about that during the Eagles game? A little twist, would you say? And the Houston Texans are headed to Kansas City after their dramatic cover behind victory. A wild card weekend coming up tonight on a brand new edition of instant replay. He's uh, outstanding. I think he's an outstanding asset, not only for us, but for the NFL. That's what Jerry Jones had to say when the Cowboys season ended. Now, seven days later, he finally issues a statement telling us the tenure of Jason Garrett as head coach of the Dallas Cowboys is now over. This comes while we're getting reports With of at least two counts. interviews for his replacement. Well, and that's Sometimes not all the Dallas guys. Cowboys are facing a busy offseason with as many as 24 free agents now, including Dak Prescott and Amari Cooper. And what happens to Jason Witten? Does he retire from playing? Could he be added to the Cowboys coaching staff? Quite frankly, I don't really care what anybody else says. I did it for those moments right out there, and uh, it was a hell of a feeling. What a win for the Houston Texans on Wild Card Weekend, coming back from a 16-point deficit to beat the Buffalo Bills. Our Andrew City was there. I'll have a report on how J.J. Watt inspired his teammates with a sack just nine weeks after having surgery to repair a torn pectoral muscle. Now the Texans face the Kansas City Chiefs. Next, what are the chances Houston can upset the Chiefs on the road? The sports guys are back tonight along with their opinions.
The Saints wondering if there's going to be a review for a push-off. And how ironic that an Orange Saints wildcard game against the Minnesota Vikings would end with a controversial no-call pass interference in the end zone during overtime. Remember what happened last year against the Rams for the NFC title and who survives between the Eagles and the Seahawks? We'll that be all the playoff highlights for you tonight. After New England is upset at home by the Tennessee Titans, who will be the new Super Bowl champs? All that plus is Sam Ellinger returning for his senior season in Longhorn Land. And what will happen first this offseason for the Dallas Cowboys tonight? You decide. Instant Replay is live and it's after the night beat. Lots to talk about. It is. Thanks, yep. Greg. We'll see you in just a little bit. Still to come, the latest on that deadly pileup crash in Pennsylvania. Why authorities there? At least five died today. Plus, a house explodes in Detroit with the family inside the latest on their condition and a look back at what was left behind. And no end in sight as more than 140 fires burn across Australia. The latest on the efforts to get those fires under control and how the United States is helping. Five people are dead and dozens of others injured after a multi-vehicle chain reaction crash on a Pennsylvania highway turnpike. That accident shut down the turnpike for several hours and involved a bus traveling from New York to Ohio and two semis. Here's ABC's Zachary Keish with more. A deadly chain reaction crash on the Pennsylvania turnpike early Sunday morning has left several people dead and dozens more injured. We have five people that did not survive the crash. Uh, we have several people that were transported to area hospitals. Uh, we believe it's around 60 total. A passenger bus traveling from Rockaway, New Jersey to Cincinnati, Ohio, lost control, went up on an embankment and rolled over. Was subsequently struck by two tractor trailers. Another tractor trailer came and collided with those two tractor trailers. And there was another passenger car that was also involved. Lamar Brady, a passenger on that bus, took this video shortly after the crash. He suffered minor injuries and spoke with ABC's Pittsburgh affiliate, WTAE. One of the guys, they kicked open the thing and said, everybody needs to get out, everybody needs to get out. There was one guy on top of me, and I was pushed up against the window, so we were just trying to figure out how to, you know, and get up and off the bus. Many of the injured were triaged at the scene by emergency medical services. They were really dispatching patients to multiple hospitals and making a decision of where to take those that were maybe what we call walking wounded as opposed to those that were more critical. The accident shut down the turnpike for hours. According to authorities, some drivers on the road reported there was a change in weather, but it's still unclear whether that played a factor in the crash. The road conditions seem to be fine in that area. We treat all night long. The NTSB is heading to the scene to assist in the investigation. Zachary Keish, ABC News, New York. News around America now a possible gas explosion injured six people at a family's home in Detroit. That home now a pile of debris. Fire officials say six people were inside the home when it burst into flames. They're now suffering from second and third degree burns as well as smoke inhalation. Firefighters put out the flames as neighbors watched in disbelief. Prayers up for everybody that's, that was in there. I just hope nobody got hurt. Investigators say there was possibly a gas leak that may have caused the blast. They also say the ages of those injured range from 30 to 40 years old. Multiple vehicles were also damaged near that home. A suspect is in custody in Florence, South Carolina, after allegedly shooting and killing an airport public safety officer. The incident took place at the Florence Regional Airport when the officer was conducting a traffic stop. Dozens of police officers responded to the scene to investigate. An official with the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division says the suspect ran away but was later found and arrested. Initially, entrances and exits to the airport were blocked, but the airport has since resumed normal operations. In New York, thousands of people marched across the Brooklyn Bridge today as part of an anti-hate rally. No hate, no fear is the main message of the rally, which comes as the Jewish community finds itself at the center of a number of recent hate crimes. The NYPD says there have been at least 14 reported anti-Semitic acts in just the last two weeks. And officers are now looking into another possible hate crime in Brooklyn, where police say a group of three people walked into a kosher bagel store on Friday and made threatening anti-Semitic remarks. Meanwhile, police say there were 423 hate crimes in the city in just 2019. More than two years after sexual assault allegations against Harvey Weinstein ushered in the Me Too movement, the disgraced movie mogul is now facing a criminal trial which could put him in jail for the rest of his life. Jury selection is scheduled to start this week in the New York City case. 
uh, which involves allegations that Weinstein raped one woman in a Manhattan hotel room in 2013 and performed forcible sex acts on a different woman in 2006. It is the only criminal case to arise from dozens of allegations against the producer. Weinstein has pleaded not guilty. In central Florida, severe storms left a trail of damage yesterday. Witnesses told the National Weather Service they saw a tornado touch down in one area, but the service has not confirmed any tornadoes yet. Several homes and buildings in various cities were heavily damaged, many by falling trees and limbs. There are no reports of serious injuries, but authorities say one person did suffer minor cuts to his head when a tree limb came through the roof of his home. Around the world tonight, skies turned blood red above parts of southeast Australia today as residents there sought refuge from the deadly bushfires. A senior firefighter there described the past 24 hours to CNN as one of their worst days ever. As of right now, a total of 146 fires are burning across the state with 65 uncontained. At last check, more than 20 people have died, but that number is expected to rise. Many Australian residents say they are fed up with their government's response. What would you say to the Prime Minister, Jenny? Wake, get out. Get out. You cannot lead this country. You are hopeless. You're a moron. Get out. That's my message to ScoMo. Go. More than 2,700 firefighters were tackling the flames today. The United States, meanwhile, sending help from the Forest Service and the Department of the Interior. Looking outside with live cam tonight here at home. Clear skies, getting cool, temperatures falling into the low 50s. We'll be in the mid 40s as you head out the door in the morning. And I do want to give you a look at what's going on in Australia right now. Temperature wise, it's Monday afternoon there. And there's still a lot of heat uh, in the central and northern part of the country. Also there to the west in Perth, they're in the 90s. But if you look down Sydney and Melbourne, these are the states of New South Wales and Victoria. That's where a lot of those fires have been very densely uh, uh, populated there. They're in the 50s in Melbourne, 70s in Sydney because they've got some cloud cover, some light rain in and around Sydney and Melbourne, and they've got good chances of rain coming up over the next couple of days, so good to see that. Coming up in just a bit, I'll get you a look at your forecast for here at home, which includes two cold fronts this week. Courtney. Thank you, Katie. The timeshares can be tempting, especially as we head towards the summer months. Some tips on how to avoid being tricked by seemingly good deals. That's next. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. If you're looking ahead to spring and summer vacations, a timeshare might seem like a good idea. Buying into them is often easy, but getting out of those contracts can be tricky. That's where timeshare exit companies claim they can help. But as 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz explains, those exit plans are not always foolproof. For Solomon Choi, buying a timeshare in Las Vegas was fast and easy. Getting out of that timeshare, not so much. When I received the first annual maintenance and renewal bill, I was like, wait, this is a pretty big number. After six years, his annual maintenance fee soared to $2,000. That's when he decided he wanted out. Once you're locked in, you are in for life in terms of these annual renewal and maintenance fees. Choi turned to a timeshare exit company. Often they make sweeping promises, including a guarantee that they can get you out of a timeshare contract. But that guaranteed exit comes with a big upfront price. Choi says he paid more than $11,000 to an exit company that promised he'd be rid of his timeshare within 18 months. Consumer advocates say beware. We've seen numerous timeshare exit companies guarantee getting consumers out of their timeshare contracts and never end up delivering. It's important that you read those contracts carefully and don't pay a bunch of money up front for promises. So how can you get out of a timeshare contract without losing money in the process? More timeshare companies now have deed back programs to make it easier for timeshare owners to get out of their contract. You can also hire a realtor who specializes in timeshares. But remember, timeshares are often a depreciating asset, so you should be prepared to take a loss. The American Resort Development Association says the timeshare industry has worked to warn consumers about fraud in the exit industry and is committed to better communicating with owners about safe exit options. As for Choi, he's still waiting to see if his timeshare exit company holds up their end of the deal. Marilyn Moritz, KSET 12 News. Stick with us, a sweet story of two lovers reunited in the new year. What's next?
is my favorite story of the year so far. Love in the new year and the two moms teaming up to make it happen. ABC's Tom Yamas has a special story. When Nick Doyle agreed to accompany his mom to an Ohio airport. Oh my God. He had no idea he was about to reunite with the love of his life. Oh. His girlfriend, Gabby, who he hasn't seen in weeks. The couple has Down syndrome. They met at a conference a few months earlier when he asked her to dance. When he put his arm around me, it felt like I was in princess. Sparks flew that first night, but there was one mistake. He left the conference, forgot to get her contact information. She was like, well, how am I going to find him? I'm like, well, you'll be like Cinderella. If he wants to find you, he'll find you. And he did, right? He did. The couple stayed in touch and the relationship grew. He is adorable, and I love when he says me gives and presents. They decided they would be exclusive boyfriend and girlfriend um, at the Pittsburgh conference in June. Yep, it's true. Time and distance are hard for any couple. Nick lives in Ohio and Gabby in North Carolina. So their mothers decided to play Cupid. I called Lisa, and she said, come, come to Ohio. <laughs> Let's not tell them. Let's surprise them. And here's that moment again. <laughs> I was surprised, and I was shocked, and I was happy. Oh, my God. Thank you. Oh. I ran into his arms. I was really happy to see him. Nick and Gabby excited about their future together. Seeing Gabby look at him and love him as deeply as she does, oh. it just, I mean, it brings tears to my eyes. Oh, my God. How am I supposed to do weather now? I know. I'm sorry. We had to leave you over here by yourself. <laughs> We're over here crying. Good luck. <laughs> Nothing I have for you is as good as that. So uh -huh. may not even may not even try. We'll give it a shot anyway. It was a beautiful weekend. High temperatures today. 70s across the board. That's trending about 10 degrees above average for this time of year. Our average high in San Antonio is 62. We were up to 75 today. Not many folks complaining about about that. T the temperatures just complaining about the cedar uh, right now. It's getting pretty cool out there. 51 in Del Rio, 57 in Gonzales, 40s up in the hill country. We'll see our temperatures fall into the low to mid 40s over the next several hours. Look at our dew points, a big spread now in our dew points. Winds became southerly yesterday. South wind really settled in today. We've got 20s dew point wise west of I-35, 30s here in San Antonio, 40s pushing 50 degrees down a little bit closer to the coast. So we do have some uh, more humid air that will be working in from the coast tonight through a portion of the day tomorrow before our next cold front kind of sweeps out all of this humidity. So through tomorrow morning, this is Monday at 8 a.m. If you're down on the coastal bend southeast of San Antonio, you have a better shot at seeing some patchy fog on your Monday morning commute. So keep that in mind. A little bit of patchy fog here and there will be possible up to the I-35 corridor, but I don't expect it anywhere to be so dense and widespread that it causes big issues for the morning commute. But just keep in mind a little bit of patchy fog possible to start the day tomorrow. 45 your temperature at 7 a.m. Climbing into the mid to upper 60s at lunchtime. High temperatures tomorrow expected to be back into the low to mid 70s. So another warm January day for us tomorrow. You'll notice some high thin clouds in the sky through the afternoon hours and then our next cold front arrives tomorrow evening after sunset around 8 9 p.m. here in San Antonio. You'll notice that it's through when things start to turn a bit breezy later tomorrow night and overnight Monday through early on Tuesday. That first front, as I mentioned, doesn't do a whole lot for us. It cools us down by Tuesday by about 10 degrees, so that's nothing to sneeze at. Uh, we'll be in the 60s as we head into the day Wednesday as well. Warming back into the 70s Thursday into Friday ahead of cold front number two that arrives Friday evening through early on Saturday to clear us out and cool things down once again. So no rain with tomorrow's front. Our only shot at rain this week looks to come late Friday uh, and even Friday night into the pre-dawn hours of Saturday morning as cold front number two uh, moves through Texas. So early Friday morning surface low pressure system will be developing likely in North Texas southern Oklahoma. By the time we get to Friday, we'll have some some dry days early this week, but surface moisture will be filling back in really across the eastern portion of the state as we get into Friday morning. And it's the combination of the energy right around the surface low 
and moisture that will produce some strong to severe thunderstorms likely well to our east as we get into Friday afternoon and Friday night. This yellow area is an area that has been outlined by the Storm Prediction Center uh, for some severe thunderstorm activity Friday afternoon and evening. That's from Houston up through East Texas to the I-20 corridor and then points east. That does not include San Antonio. I do think we could see an isolated thunderstorm in and around San Antonio Friday afternoon and evening, uh, but really we're just looking at a low end shot of some passing showers, maybe a rumble of thunder uh, late Friday evening, and then even some showers possible late Friday night as the cold front itself moves through. This front will set us up for a, another beautiful weekend. Sunny skies roll back in by Saturday, breezy conditions, and will be cooler by the start of next weekend as well with highs falling back into the low 60s. So no big blasts of cold air in the forecast this week, and we'll hope that maybe we can bump that 20% chance of rain up just a bit. Higher. Yes, please. You did a good job through that. Yeah. I think you did a great job. Tim had to grab for the tissues. I'm going to say it was Mountain It was a Mountain Seer. Seer. <laughs> there might be a heart in there. I don't know. <laughs> I think you have a heart. <laughs> All right, moving on. No surprises at the box office this weekend. As Star Wars, The Rise of Skywalker, light speed skips all the way to the top, slashing through the competition like a Jedi. We have the numbers after the break. Frozen 2 is still hot. $11.3 million gave the sequel fifth place and a domestic total of $450 million. The latest take on The Grudge managed a fourth place debut with $11.3 million, despite a rare F grade from audience survey firm CinemaScore. The new take on Little Women moved up a spot to third place, earning $13.6 million. Welcome to Jumanji. Jumanji The Next Level stayed in second place. $26.5 million gave it $236 million domestic. Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker topped the chart for the third straight weekend, grossing $33.7 million for a domestic total of $451 million. In Hollywood, I'm David Daniel. Our San Antonio Spurs will have their hands full again with the Greek Freak as the Spurs have to face the NBA's best Milwaukee Bucks in back-to-back -back games. Oof. And is Sam Ellinger returning for his senior season with new offensive coordinator for the Texas Longhorn? Let's head over to Greg Simmons to find out what's on it. That seems to be the debate because now he's going to have to learn a new offensive system in his right. last year. So does he go to the NFL or not? We'll discuss that. Boxing returns to the Alamo Dome this coming weekend with two local boxers fighting in their hometown for the very first time. Coming up tonight on a brand new edition of Instant Replay. The competitiveness was there. I think we can play better on Monday night, and uh, we'll give them a run, and we'll try to win a basketball game. What did the Spurs do wrong to deserve this? They have to face the best team in the NBA on back-to-back -back games, losing the Milwaukee Bucks last night, 127-118. Now to face the Greek Freak and his teammates tomorrow night at home, the Texas Longhorns in their season on a winning note by taking the Bolero Alamo Bowl over Utah. Now will quarterback Sam Ellinger return for his senior season with a new offensive coordinator? Everyone used to always ask me that question, you know, when are you going to fight here in San Antonio? Um, and it's finally here. Boxing returns to the Alamo Dome this coming weekend with both Joshua Franco and Hector Tanahara fighting in their hometown for the very first time. Hear what they had to say about climbing into the ring in San Antonio. How do our San Antonio Rampage get ready for a tough season? Our Jessica Hunt found out the hard way as she hits the ice for training by fire. All that plus who will be the next coach of the Dallas Cowboys and two Division I commits from San Antonio help the West beat the East in the All-American Bowl. Instant replay is live and it's next and Great job, Jessica, for trying to hang in there oh with those God. guys. It's tough. Thanks, Super Greg. intense. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks, Greg. Well, it was a New Year's Eve celebration with both highs and lows. How one firefighter made sure one couple started off the new year on the right track. Well, we know the news can be hard to hear at times, so we always want to end your night by telling you something good. A New York man decided to ring in the new year by proposing to his longtime girlfriend. She said yes, but a few hours later, there was heartbreak as the couple dropped the ring down a grate. No, no they decided to go to a nearby fire station and with a coat hanger and duct tape, a firefighter was able to get it out. That's Firefighters too, always saving the day. stressful. Just another reminder, we are launching a new segment called Leading SA. GMSA's Max Massey will be sitting down with leaders of San Antonio to talk about current issues in our community, what's being done to solve problems.
and about the future. The first interview will be with Mayor Ron Nuremberg, and we want you to get involved. Right now on KSAT.com, you can submit your questions that we may ask the mayor. Head over to KSAT.com to submit your questions right now, and you could see your question asked tomorrow night. That's all the time we have for now for all of us here at KSAT. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to tune in to GMSA for all your latest overnight news. An all new instant replay starts now. You already know, it starts today. Win or go home. It starts with the face paint, probably when I was like 12 years old. And again, I find little things and I just add them on, I'll add them on, and eventually you got this. Don't do face paint when you're young, it just corrupts your mind. All the Houston Texas fans in San Antonio, we're here representing for y'all. Alamo City Elite, you already know what it is. Blackos in the house. Woo! Let's go, baby! Sausage, we got some uh, riblets, pork tenderloin. <laughs> these are jalapeno poppers right here. And let me tell you something eat one of these and, and, and we'll beat the bills. Hands down, beat the bills. Go! We just doing the big tail game because we're going to celebrate this victory over Buffalo. Okay. Well, we're going to win the game. Okay. Okay. I got the best changing stuff. Let's go, Buffalo. It's going to be the year. 2020, Barbara Walter said it. The Bills are going to win, I promise you. Any different plans getting ready for a playoff game? Uh, no, we've been practicing all year for this. <laughs> <laughs> we got this down. That's funny. Practicing all year for this. Hey, the poppers work. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to a brand new edition of Instant Replayers. Hope you had a great holiday season, got to spend it with family and friends, and welcome to 2020. The rest of the NFL playoffs are anything like the first weekend of the postseason. We're in for a big treat. What with the Texans come back against the Buffalo Bills and the Tennessee Titans upset of the New England Patriots, meaning we'll have a new Super Bowl champion this season. But first. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Seven days after watching the Dallas Cowboys season come to an end, a disappointing end. Team owner Jerry Jones finally making a statement today that ends the 10-year tenure of Jason Garrett as his head coach, saying the team will not seek a contract extension for Garrett. Amid reports, Jones has already interviewed at least two former NFL coaches for his replacement. The most recent former Packers head coach, Mike McCarthy, who, according to Calvin Watkins, spent the last two days with Jerry and Stephen Jones, with his interview finally concluding today. The Cowboys have also talked with the former Bengals head coach Marvin Lewis. Now we wait to see what the Joneses decide is who will lead the Cowboys going forward. Here is just part of what Jones had to say in a statement released tonight during the Eagles playoff game. It says in part about Jason Garrett's firing, we are extremely grateful to Jason Garrett for his more than 20 years of service to the Dallas Cowboys as a player assistant coach and head coach. Jason Garrett's legacy with the Dallas Cowboys will always be that someone who strived for greatness every day that he walked through the door and as someone who instilled the virtues of enthusiasm, hard work, and appreciation for the profession and all the men who played with him and for him. He is and always will remain a cherished member of the Dallas Cowboys family and his contributions to the organization are greatly appreciated. Now, besides hiring a new head coach, the Cowboys have other decisions to make. They have still not signed Dak Prescott to a contract extension, even though his rookie contract is now done. His new deal would have to start at around $132 million, given deals other NFL quarterbacks have already been given, and it would average almost $40 million a year if they choose to use the franchise tag. Same goes for Amari Cooper. Cooper, who says he wants to be a Cowboy next season. The question is, will he? And if he stays, what will the Cowboys offer him in a new contract or franchise tag at about $16 million a season? And finally, is Jason Witten done? After coming out of one-year retirement, only to finish 8-8 eight and eight, again, will the future Hall of Famer return for one more shot at a Super Bowl title or retiring coach in 2020? We'll have more on the very, very busy offseason facing the Dallas Cowboys coming up. The NFC East champion Philadelphia Eagles hosting the Seattle Seahawks in the final game of the wild card week. And the Eagles quarterback Carson Wentz making his first ever playoff start that wouldn't last long. In the second series for Philadelphia, Wentz gets flushed out of the pocket, sacked. But look at the replay. Jadavian Clowney drives the crown of his helmet to the back of Wentz's head. No flag was thrown. Wentz would lead the game two plays later to be evaluated for a head injury. He did not return. The Seahawks defense had a season high seven sacks today. Russell Wilson threw for 325 yards. 160 of those went to DK Metcalf and this one that one catch right there put the game away third quarter Wilson on the play action goes deep to Metcalf who goes to the ground after making the grab but did not get touched by a defender he stretches for the end zone for the score and the Seahawks become the third road team to win in the weekend 17 to 9. DK and I are really enjoying playing together. There's a lot more ahead of us. Um, I kind of told him in the locker room, you know, great game, you know, keep balling. But we haven't done anything yet. That's just the reality. So 
and we're just getting started. Um, you know, the goal is bigger than just this one game. Um, and let's see if we can, you know, strike magic again next week. All right, for the two years in a row now, the Saints season ends in controversy over whether pass interference should have been called. This time it was at the hands of the Minnesota Vikings. Let's get right to the action. Seven seconds left. Saints down three. Need a 49-yard field goal from Will Lutz, who missed a 28-yarder earlier in the game to send this one into overtime. He didn't miss this time, and they're headed to OT. Vikings get the ball first. Kirk Cousins drops back. Fired downfield to Adam Thielen, who makes the catch over the shoulder grab. Vikings ball at the Saints' two-yard line. So it's third and goal now. Saints bring the pressure. Cousins finds Kyle Rudolph in the corner of the end zone for the game-winning touchdown. Vikings won it 26-20 in overtime, but wait, some people think there was offensive pass interference on the play, pushing off. Refs don't review it, so the play stands. After the game, Saints head coach Sean Payton staying far away from making any comments about officiating on the game-winning catch. Listen, um, that, that wasn't I didn't, I didn't really, I didn't see any officials. I saw Mike, we chatted for a little bit and saw some of the other players we coached in the Pro Bowl and congratulated them and uh, they did a good job. They played well. I played a lot of basketball in my life and um, they brought all out pressure and, and Kirk gave me a chance and I, I just go up and get the rebound. Go up and get it and, and make a play to help our team win. All right, here's a look at the NFL playoffs in the NFC Divisional Round. The Vikings will be at the San Francisco 49ers Saturday at 3.35 Levi Stadium, and the Seahawks will travel to Green Bay to take on the Packers Sunday at 5.40 at Lambeau Field. The Houston Texans are headed to the next round of the NFL playoffs. They're one of the most exciting wildcard games we have ever seen, coming from 16 points down to win the game against Buffalo in overtime with a field goal. Now, the Texans would score 19 straight points, 11 of those coming in the fourth quarter alone, reminding a lot of folks of Buffalo's dramatic 32-point comeback against the then-Houston Oilers way back in 1993. The spark delivered by J.J. Watt playing his first game since October when he tore a pectoral muscle. The sack helped fire up his teammates. Deshaun Watson will become the star of this game, first by dragging two defenders into the end zone to complete a 20-yard run to end the third quarter. The Texans would take the lead in the fourth when Watson finds Carlos Hyde on a five-yard touchdown pass, tack on a two-point conversion. The Texans are now leading 19-60. Now the Bills would tie it up at 19 all forcing overtime where Watson became the great Houdini. That's when he was able to escape the sack, rolling out and finding Taiwan Jones for the 34-yard completion to set up the game-winning 28-yard field goal. Look at this escape by him. I can't know how he did it still to this day. and still able to find Jones downfield and get that reception. Then it's Kai Fairbairn. The Texans advance to face the Kansas City Chiefs next week, 22-19 in overtime. But before the game, Watson had a message and a gift for his teammates. It was actually um, the new uh, beats, um, wireless earphones, and I wrote, let's be great uh, today, and I wrote number four. And that's the text I sent earlier this year, uh, this week, and I uh, just had to, you know, remind them, um, because, you know, that's what we want to do. You know, the the world is against us. You know, we just kind of keep fighting, and, you know, everyone is, is, is going to, you know, there's going to be critics, they are going to be, you know, guys and people that's going to, you know, be on our train too, but at the same time, we just got to worry about us in our locker room. So, uh, you know, why not be great? And, you know, how great do you want to be to be able to achieve the goal? All right, there will be a new Super Bowl champion after the New England Patriots were upset at home by the Tennessee Titans in what could be the final chapter for Tom Brady as quarterback for the Patriots. Ryan Tannehill led the NFL with a 117.5 passer rating, but was held to just 72 yards passing his first ever playoff game. The star of this game for the Titans, the running back Derrick Henry, who helped celebrate his 26th birthday by rushing for 182 yards, scoring one touchdown in the 20-13 win. It's the greatest organization and, you know, playing for Mr. Kraft all these years and uh, for Coach Belichick, I mean, there's, um, you know, there's nobody who's had a better career, I would say, than me, you know, just being with them. So I'm very blessed and I don't know what the future looks like, so and I'm not going to predict it. So who knows what the future holds? All right, we will see. The AFC division round looks like this. Tennessee at Baltimore, Saturday at 7.15. And then Houston will travel to Kansas City Sunday at 2.05 at Arrowhead Stadium. And KSAT 12 Sports will be there. Time now for tonight's instant replay poll question. What will happen first this offseason for the Dallas Cowboys? Will they hire a new head coach, sign Dak Prescott to a contract extension or franchise tag, sign Amari Cooper to the same, a contract extension or franchise tag? Or will Jason Witten retire from playing you let us know. Vote through social media. Email us or text us at 210-218-6744. We look forward to your answer and comments tonight. We are just getting started with a special playoff edition of Instant Replay. Up next. Uh, I don't make the decisions. Uh, well, I wouldn't be in the position I'm in.
Did the lack of a long-term contract extension play on the mind of Dak Prescott this season? Now he's about to become a free agent along with Amari Cooper. Just two of the 24 free agents the Dallas Cowboys have on their roster. What does Coop think about testing free agency? And after 10 seasons wearing the star, has Sean Lee played in his last game for the Cowboys? He will let us know. Obviously, we kind of threw the plan out the window there in the fourth quarter in overtime because it's all hands on deck and do what you can. It is the sack that ignited the Texans' comeback. J.J. Watt playing in his first game since tearing his pectoral muscle back in October, needing only nine weeks to recover from surgery when it takes most people three to four months. Clearly, his effort to make the playoffs inspired his teammates. Our Andrew Seeley was there. That bore on J.J.'s impact on the Texans' big win. Did Tom Herman talk to Sam Ellinger before hiring their new offensive coordinator at UT? And is Sam set to return for his senior season? That's coming up a bit later. And the Spurs can't contain the Greek freak and how have to face Milwaukee again tomorrow. We'll get you ready when Instant Replay continues live next.